the title of my talk is Rebooting Lifelong Learning. Um, and specifically, uh, I like to, to term by telling stories about our world. And you'll probably get a, a little more uh, read on, on what I mean by that. Uh, I'm the uh, chairman and CEO of the Map Story Foundation. I'll also explain a little bit of that. And our, our biggest purpose in life is to build a thing called mapstory.org. Love to have you go to, the, uh, go to the site, give us some feedback, um, but also love to turn you into everyday map storytellers. So education is a national priority, right? Um, it's also, we also uh, we've heard a lot of things on stage today about how education is somewhat in crisis. Uh, we saw slides about how really education hasn't changed since the 1950s. It's basically in the same model. Um, we have seen a lot of progress, a lot of investment. Uh, the last panel I thought was fantastic. Uh, and it's really shown us that in kind of the educational technology space, we have applied new technologies uh, to help us. Primarily, uh, we've seen a lot of progress in English and math. We've seen a lot of focus over the past handful of years in uh, uh, more of the kind of STEM uh, uh, side of the equation where educational technology has a lot of promise. Uh, you know, again, we've seen that on our panels here. Geography I include, and you're going to see this as a theme. You heard the name Map Story. You suspect it's going to pop up a number of different times. But there's a lot of different sides to geography. Um, uh, in the science, uh, technology, engineering, math space, um, uh, we talk about uh, geodesy. We talk about remote sensing. We talk about all the advanced math that's necessary to actually understand location and position in our world, to be able to take satellites, put them in space, and make observations about our world, and then throw them on Google Earth. It's extremely technical. You have to know boatloads of science. You have to understand the technology. Uh, you, you have to know ridiculous amounts of math. Photogrammetry as a discipline is, is literally just math about being able to discern location on our world. But really, this has been industrialized, right? In the past decade, all of a sudden, we have GPS in every phone. Uh, you have Google Earth. You can see satellite imagery pretty much any time you want to, to your heart's content. So STEM you know, uh, has a big component in geography. But there's these other things uh, uh, that have to do with people. Um, you, you think about uh, the social sciences. Uh, how do we teach them? How do we understand people on Earth over time? Uh, the humanities, how do we understand expression by all these people on Earth over time? History really is something that unfolds over our landscape over time. And you know, language is something that we use to actually tell our stories, to tell our history, to understand our social structure. Uh, so language isn't just something you learn that's totally uh, separate from <laughs> how humans behave uh, on Earth. So I like to point out that you know, there's this thing called spatial thinking. And some people say, you know, I'm really a spatial thinker. And other people say, ah, I'm really not a spatial thinker. And they think that has to do with, you know, knowing which way is north and understanding, you know, the, the, uh, in a complex building like this, you know, what's my way around? I'm not really good uh, spatial thinker. But spatial thinking really is something different. Um, spatial thinking is something that says, okay, I, as a human being on Earth, have to navigate. I have to find my way around through life. Whether I'm good at it or bad at it, I am still doing it. And spatial thinking has this kind of unique uh, role in the education space um, because it requires you to make calculations in terms of distances. It requires you to understand the technology and the science associated with maps. Um, our satellite imagery of today really is just uh, the new age maps of uh, yesteryear. Um, you have to understand your geography, but when you're t telling stories, uh, uh, trying to understand history, trying to understand your social sciences, geography is key. Um, and, and spatial thinking it serves this integrative role to take the things like our English and math, which are you know, the things that standardized tests say our students must know, integrating STEM, and then taking all these other cats and dogs that, frankly, uh, are in crisis also in, in our schools today. So even if you think that you're not a spatial thinker, everybody is a project-based thinker. When I talk about project-based thinking, my favorite project is brew, home brewing beer. Um, and think about it. What is it? Um, it's a really inter interdisciplinary sort of thing. You uh, actually have to understand what specific <laughs> gravity is. You actually have to understand the ins and outs of the fermentation process. It's, it's also kind of an, an art. Um, it's an artisanal process. So you actually uh, start developing, I don't know, I'd say some appreciation for the art. But it's project-based learning, right? It's something that you prepare for. 
is something that you act on, and it's something that you reflect on over and over in an iterative way. And if you keep homebrewing beer, it's something that you reflect on over and over and over and get better at it. You're gathering facts, you're gathering observations, um, and then you're uh, refining your worldview and, and continuing on as somebody that's better and better at this. Well, imagine if there was actually pro a project, project-based learning, that could help you also engage in that spatial thinking that uh, uh, encouraged that interdisciplinary uh, understanding of all those different disciplines that, frankly, we're not doing terribly well in the school system. That's what we like to call MapStory. Uh, MapStory.org, you can go on that site and we'll uh, show you some stuff. I've canned some videos here because I was told the internet wasn't going to be very good. So we'll see how this does with, uh, I saw the last video, so we'll see how this video goes. So this is a project we call Map Story Local. Uh, one of our uh, early adopters, somebody who just thought this was cool, grew up in Story County, Iowa, Ames, Iowa, um, and put together, uh, always wanted to tell a story of Ames, Iowa from when it was just a patch of dirt until today. Um, so he put together you know, with some, with some friends, also reaching out to City Hall, a bunch of people in a bunch of different disciplines, was able to put together the data and load it into MapStory. That starts with the original street grid and you know, just a couple of the structures that were there in the mid-1860s. Uh, I guess early 1860s. And he's able to load this all up and depict all change over time in Ames, Iowa. How many times have you walked through a town and say, you know, especially like I'm from Old Town, Alexandria. You walk through Alexandria, you say, I wonder what this was like in the 1700s. I wonder what this was like in the 1800s. Now, what is, that? is that a history question? Is it a geography question? Uh, you know, in order to understand it, do I need to know some math? It, it turns out it's, it's a project that forces you to really engage in the world. And once you dig in, it's uh, something that lets you engage the full spectrum. Right? You could be a student working with an older person who has knowledge of the history. You could be a teacher working with a practitioner. You can be a student working with a researcher at a university. It enables lifelong learning um, uh, on a project basis to not only um, uh, tell stories about your world, but to accumulate more knowledge about the world that everybody else can bonus from. Map Story is a global data commons. Every piece of data that you put in is shareable to the world. It's your gift uh, to humanity. And in this case, uh, Nitten put together uh, the, the complete history of the evolution of Ames, Iowa, uh, at least from the perspective of uh, every uh, residential building, every commercial building, every road. This is the expansion in yellow of Iowa State University. Um, but many people in Ames, Iowa just kind of live through there and never understand the richness of their history. They don't understand the stories there. This isn't a story. These are just story layers in our parlance. And so we also enable people to actually uh, put in annotations and tell their own story. And while we all have a common history right, that we experience, we all experience it differently. So we enable people to tell their own stories about Ames, Iowa, however they want. So a map story local, that is an opportunity here for everybody across the spectrum to work together and crowdsource our knowledge about the world. Our goal with Map Story Local is to let everybody in every city on Earth crowdsource everything that's going on. So if they're in Rome, that's going to go pretty far back. Ames, Iowa only goes back to the early 1860s, but it enables the community to come together regardless of who they are with spatial thinking. And these projects are unbelievable learning experiences. So we're not just talking about crowdsourcing, as I said. We're talking about storytelling. We're talking about passionate information communities, right? A lot of people think, you know, educators educate, right? Educators sit in a classroom with students and they educate the students. And the students, by virtue of being school, learn. Well, I think all of us that have gotten into the professional world realize that we keep learning. Every project we're engaged in, we learn more and more and more. Now, our projects aren't necessarily structured to let us you know, engage in history and engage in geography and understand the humanities and all those sorts of things. But we have many different passionate information communities, people that just do energy and natural resources, people that just do kind of agriculture and understanding, you know, the agriculture and the trades in their region, people that just study armed groups, people that just study biology and extinction, people that study why do states fail in Africa and Asia. And, and you know, frankly, on every continent. Uh, people that are just interested in the economy and they're focused on maybe finance, maybe manufacturing, maybe trade. People who are only worried about genocide and human rights. Why? Because these are full-time jobs, right? To do your job right, you really focus. 
and you really garner a, a huge amount of information about what's going on in the world, and everything you know is about things that are going on in space and time, right? It may just be local. It may be about your village. Maybe about your town. Maybe about your city. You may really not have any uh, larger interest in you know these other passion and information communities. You're just a, a local person that is is really uh, immersed in in that experience. Or you may be somebody worried about the grand sweep of history, the rise and fall of the Roman Empire. We have people all over the world that are experts in all these things, but right now they're not able to share what they know about the world, how it's evolved over time with these various dimensions, because there's no common way to do it. What we're doing is we provide that big bucket in the sky that lets you put spatial, temporal representations of change over time, regardless of what it's about, so that everybody else can have access to it and reuse it for whatever purpose they want, for whatever story they want to use. When you put it up because you are a practitioner in a space, every teacher can use it to teach their students. If you're a student making local observations, Every elderly person can use it in order to, you know, tell the history of their life. Um, so let's uh, let's see. There we go. Video plays. So you know, the United States a lot has a long history. Of this our founding fathers were spatial thinkers. Five minutes. Um, were spatial thinkers, right? George Washington was a professional surveyor. He surveyed the state of Virginia and much of the stuff uh, east of the Mississippi. Um, Thomas Jefferson actually spent 30 years of his life uh, writing a book uh, about the uh, state of Virginia. I wrote the title down and uh, notes on the state of Virginia. 30 years, which is, is just a map story all by itself to explain to this French guy who asked him the question, you know, could you describe Virginia for me, right? Virginia has a long history, where it came from, how it came about. In this case, in our Constitution, right, there's not that many things required in our Constitution. The census is one of them. Why? Because you need a census to reapportion um, uh, representative democracy every 10 years. In this case, you just saw the spread of counties, right, because we had colonies, then we had states, um, and then counties in each state. And here you're watching the demographics, right, the density, uh, the urbanization patterns that have gone on. And this is just a story layer. This isn't even a map story. This can be used to tell 20 different map stories in a bunch of different classes. Um, or it uh, you know, could be used by researchers. Or you, know, you name it, I don't care. The whole point is this was paid for once by the federal government, inaccessible to the citizenry. Then it was paid for by, again by the government, by the National Science Foundation. So somebody ended up putting it in a DVD. And then you had to pay for it again to get the DVD. Right? And this is knowledge about our world that lets us understand at a national level, not just a local level, our world in a better way. But it's not just about national, it's about global. Now we can say all we want, you know, we're going to bring things home and uh, you know, we're going to focus on the home front and all these great things, however, you know, we're still engaged in the world. Arab Spring is still going to happen regardless of whether we're home or abroad. And we need to understand, whoops, change over time. So let me see if I can make this one play. There we go. This is uh, the evolution of political borders in Africa from 1879 till now. Somebody actually had to put this together at Brown University. This is academic research, right? This is um, uh, archival, uh, primary, and secondary uh, source research that was really lost to the world because it's put into a nice little flash application. Right? Once it's there, it's not spatial data anymore. Nobody can then overlay conflict data about Africa. Nobody can then overlay drought and famine data about Africa that are collected from different information communities. Here, once we we're able to put it in map story, now it enables it for everybody to not just see the evolution of political borders, right? the indigenous nation states that were in gray, and then all of these bright blues and pinks that are colonial powers that swept through Africa and then through wars and treaties vied for dominance, um, and then as it goes on through the 50s, you'll see post-decolonization, uh, um, uh, and you'll see the different kinds of political forms that took over. This is now data that lets everybody overlay their data and tell their stories and understand it. So if you're trying to understand you know, where is North Africa, what historical moment are they in, it's good to actually know what historical moment they're in. Right? Actually, and we don't necessarily know that because it's not our local experience, but that information is out there. It's just until map story, it's been extremely hard to have access to. So we provide a home for homeless data. In many ways, it's like that YouTube moment for video. Before YouTube, what did you have? You had World Wide Web, it's probably pre-Google. You know, you went to Alta Vista and you searched for video. When you got there, it was a dead link or it was a slow link because nobody had a good video server. So all we're doing is providing that bucket in the sky that everybody can put their understanding of the world and change over time and tell stories with it. So really there's kind of two things going on um, that I like to point out. There's a location, there, there's a revolution 
uh, in location awareness. We've become a location aware society just in uh, the past 10 years. Everybody has GPS in their phone. Everybody can use Google Earth. Every little kid growing up now can peer over the horizon to understand another part of the world just by using their mom or dad's iPad. Um, that simply didn't exist, and it hasn't existed for the thousands of years of humanity. Now, you know, we're providing a place where all those people who have had access to the world or have had access to the historical record, which has really been a very small number in society, to make that available to everybody uh, as we become a location-aware society. But it's not just being a location-aware society. We have the maker revolution. And being a maker isn't just about making a piece of hardware. In this case, you can actually make history. You can actually dig into the historical record and make that available to everybody else to use as an educational resource or use as a basis is one of their stories. So, um, you know, we at Map Story we've launched this as a 501c3 nonprofit. It's free to use. It's free to share. Um, right now, we're taking any, uh, giving accounts to anybody that wants them, and you can give accounts to anybody that you want to give them to. Um, so, we encourage you to think about this to not only use this to uh, for your own edification, but to think about how we might use this to reshape how we think about education. It's not just about students and teachers in a classroom anymore. It's about experiential learning across an entire spectrum uh, of our society, uh, a project, a global project that everybody can participate. So thank you very much. Uh, Simple Energy we're, is a, a company based in Boulder. We're 15 people working with some of the largest uh, natural gas and electric utilities around the country, helping them to better engage their customers using the powers of the social web. We're, doing all of the, we're employing all of the marketing tricks and tools that you see deployed in campaigns and in media and marketing and using them to drive people to save energy now. Many of the solutions that we see talked about in energy are all about this long-term change, change in the world through solar power or wind power, and we think that's all really important. But instead of boiling the ocean, we're focused on saving energy right now because the cheapest kilowatt hour to produce, of course, is the one that's not used. And more so than that, one of the areas that we're specifically focused on is actually cutting the peak areas of demand. So much of energy demand, much of the capacity, rather, on the grid is all built around the peak usage, much like a data center or uh, highway constraints. We build uh, the power grid in order to meet the need on the hottest day of the uh, on the hottest day of the year at the hottest hour that's why we've built so many power plants so if we can specifically reduce that part of the energy usage we're able to have a huge impact Let's see if nice so one of the main tools that we use to do that is something called game mechanics now when we say game mechanics i don't want you to think of a 12 year old playing duck hunt in his parents basement that's not what we're doing we're using these marketing tricks and tools right the reason that half of all Americans will play the lottery every year. When you go to the Nationals game and you see grown men fighting over a t-shirt that won't fit them and that, wouldn't, that they would not have worn anyway, just because it's free and because they want to see their name on the jumbotron. You know, we think a lot about the, the Toyota Prius and the Honda Civic Hybrid. Uh, the Toyota Prius, as you probably know, outsold the Honda Civic Hybrid eight to one. But the two cars came out in the same year, depending on if you drove highway or city, the one would be better or the other. And the Honda Civic Hybrid was $5,000 cheaper. But when you park the two side by side in your driveway, a Honda Civic Hybrid looks like a Honda Civic with the word hybrid written on the bumper. Where a Toyota Prius looks like a spaceship that tells everybody you know and everybody who sees it, that guy cares about X, whatever it is you wanted them to think you cared about when you bought that car. And it works. The great thing about using these tools to trick people or motivate people or push people with leaderboards and badges, the opportunity to win an iPad, is it drives their behavior. Josephine Gonzalez in Alpine, California said that the reason she went to go flip off the lights and to uh, change out her light bulbs on her porch light was not because she wanted to save energy. Turns out she's wanted to save energy forever. It's not because she's wanted to save money. As a single grandmother of five, she's wanted to save money for a long, long time. But what changed is she saw people on a leaderboard where she, that she knew, and she knew that they were saving more energy than she was. And so that's what actually drove her to do it. In many ways, we don't get people to care about saving energy. 
we get people to act as if they care about saving energy. The vast majority of people already certainly do care. And we also change the way people perceive their utility. This is a huge deal in our space, and we know it from being here in DC with, and with all of the issues that have happened up the coast. Many utilities are trying to meet their regulatory requirements and to help people better manage their energy usage. But let's put their voices in the room for a second. Moment of truth. For me, I think the, yes. the conscious is a big deal because we have one income and he's a full-time student. So not only are we saving energy, but we're saving money. I'm sorry about the video I'm delay. I'm Eric Ponce. And I'm Colin Ponce. And we're in Lakeside, California. I would come home to two TVs on and a house full of lights on, and she would be in the bedroom by herself. <laughs> it's true. I, I would definitely do that. I would use a lot of energy because I wasn't aware, you know, of how much it was costing or how much I was using at the time. Daily usage and dollar amounts. Like for me, that, you know, that's a big impact. You can see not how much you're using, but how much it's costing you. And, you know, that's a big incentive. I got the email from my wife regarding the sg es Biggest Energy Saver program. I read it over and looked up the rules and the prices and everything and said to myself, you know, we can really win this thing. So I went on the computer and signed us both up. Yeah, I think it'd be really neat to let family members compete on Facebook with energy consumption because the contest is really what got us motivated. I did a lot of research on the types of TVs that we had and appliances that we had to find out how energy efficient they really were and I found out that our older plasma TV set really wasn't that energy efficient. So it was one of the biggest culprits of usage in our house. We're still saving money four months later after the contest because we developed habits of energy consumption while in the contest. We didn't buy any new appliances or make any energy efficiency upgrades and in this coming year we're going to save over a thousand dollars. Saving money on energy has allowed us to do more family activities. We literally went to Disneyland with our savings. Uh, when I think about our two-year-old son growing up in an energy-efficient world, I, I definitely think it's a good thing. Now, awkwardly, the video will go on for another minute as we catch up. Um, really sorry about that. Uh, Mark's asked me to be specific. That was a Lenovo issue, not a PowerPoint issue. Uh, the, um, so, so this is uh, our most recent contest that we launched in San Diego where we're having huge results over the summer just around peak performance. So we'd actually get people on the very hottest days to cut their power usage. Uh, many folks know the, the challenges that uh, Southern California has had in general just around power load. And this has really helped to get people off the grid at, that, at those peak moments, at that peak time of use. Uh, when someone logs into the application, they can see where they stand. They can add other people to the household so that not just the person who gets the bill is able to actually engage in their usage. And fundamentally, we still are driving people around something that they care about. So it's not just saving energy, but it's saving more energy relative to what your friends are saving. It's not just saving money, but it's having the opportunity to win an iPad or a gift card to a local merchant. Um, like many of the best tools online, we offer this platform across all the channels where people spend their time on social, mobile, and a lot of time just in people's email inbox. And so a simple message, timely received and delivered, can have a huge result. So in thinking about taking sort of a step away from what just what Simple Energy is up to, uh, I think we're doing cool and interesting work and we're, we're really uh, grateful to have these great partners who are engaging their customers with us. But in thinking about the, the topic of how to reboot America, we, we thought that we'd have three lessons to, to bring to anyone who's actively engaged in trying to reboot America. Um, Evan Burfield, who's around here, and I and a couple other folks in the room had worked on recovery.gov back a few years ago. And, and these are also lessons, all of which were applicable to that site and which recovery.gov exemplifies in so many ways. And that's that when presenting so any of these complex, complicated ideas, we must first make sure that they're personal, then make sure that they're actionable, and finally make sure that it's ubiquitous and our customers and users can get to them all the time. So in our context, what we make personal is that it's specific to me. In recovery.gov, we saw the first 
people, the first thing people would do when they came out to the site was go look up how the Recovery Act spending was used close to them. On our site, people really want to know contextually what is being, what their energy use is and then how it relates. Put them in context and make it specific to them, make it targeted, make it helpful, right, and make it timely. Then make sure that it's actionable. Uh, at recovery.gov, a lot of folks who saw that information would take that information and go write about it, or if it was local, they could actually go take action. They could go down to that little dot on the map in person and take a photo of it and upload it to the site. Similarly, we enable people to take an action immediately and then give them feedback. So whatever it is that you're doing, as you're thinking about that, make sure that it's not just this impractical, theoretical, I want to change the world, but you're actually giving your users a way that they can take that local action, that local hyper-targeted message you gave them, and turn it into a real action themselves. And finally, make sure that it's ubiquitous that so many tools first are on the web. And so many people, the first thing they want to do is go build a great website. I gotta tell you, the vast majority of the traffic we see still comes from people's mobile device. The number one way that we get traffic is via email. So if you're building a great website and you have not developed it around a mobile strategy, then it's highly likely that your users won't ever be able to get to it or just won't get to it nearly as often as they would otherwise. I was pretty excited the other day. I went on to Instagram.com. I saw that Instagram's now finally thinking about maybe having a website. So 50 million users later, they're like, yeah, maybe it's about time we allow you to see some of those photos on the internet. But they don't need to because they're always in my pocket. And they're right there and ready to go. And we need to make sure that the solutions that we're all building are likewise accessible to all people. And so that's what we're up to at Simple Energy. We're using game mechanics and social marketing to make saving energy social, fun, and simple. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you, Mark. Appreciate it. Uh, everyone's time to wake up. Everyone in the back, come out. Pay attention. It's a conference. I've been to many science conferences, and I hate them because scientists suck at communicating. We're terrible. In fact, most people are terrible at communicating. We can improve this. Want to know how? We use science. Surprise, surprise. So um, I'm going to pull a little bit more Nate Silver today, hopefully, and a lot less Joan Olaire. So I'm actually going to give you real evidence, and I'm not going to be, it's not going to be a lie. Hopefully some of you caught that pop culture reference. Um, I do have all the uh, references available. I hope you guys bug me afterwards. There's actually a lot of science about this. So what I'm going to talk to you today about is actually there's a lot of research that has gone into the science of scientific creativity. Yes, people want to know if they can engineer a Nobel Prize. I can't imagine why you'd want to do that. Um, but what's interesting is that the science of scientific creativity actually has a lot of direct applications to regular, everyday creativity. And you can separate what I'll call normal, everyday creative people from exceedingly creative people with things that have been found in the scientific literature. So I'm going to just touch on a few of those today. So as uh, Mark mentioned, I'm a scientist. I'm an embryonic stem cell biologist by training, and I did a lot of this, genetic engineering. And so I went from doing this to doing this. So creating glowing animals to glowing rooms. And so what I do is I bring together hundreds of people in the DC area on a regular basis, and we engineer learning entertainingly. And that's what we do at Thirst. We've created uh, entertaining, uh, enter entertaining experiences for the likes of Smithsonian, NASA, international artists, musicians, fashion designers, all around the world. We want to do it all. And we try to make learning fun. How do you do that? We got to do things that, that people want to do already. That's go out and get drunk. Now, I'm being overly simplistic about this, but the science doesn't lie. You people like to get drunk and flirt with people. That's how it works. So what if we just add learning into the mix? And believe it or not, there's a lot of science to back that up. So actually, I'm going to go back to this for a second. This is a characteristic example of people that attend our events. You have business types. You have politicos. You have scientists. You have fashion designers. We all put them in the room, and they're all exceedingly creative people. But we have to try to bring them together and actually get them to interact is actually really hard. It's a fine line we have to walk. So why do we do this? Because I think that everyone needs to relearn how to learn. You see, you associate learning with something that's really, sorry for lack of a better word, crappy. You think of a boring teacher, a terrible professor, a giant ginger on stage that's talking very loudly at you right now, <laughs> right? We want to associate things like this with better, more fun things, things that you already do, like I said, mentioned earlier, going out and drinking. So what do we do at Thirst? We engineer learning in an entertaining way. 
And the lovely way we do it is through science, my favorite. So believe it or not, there's a lot I'm going to touch on a little bit. Why would we use science? Well, because it's exceedingly reliable, it's rigorous, and it's directive. Science tells us a direction to go. It's testable. The best part about this is that I can actually look it up and not rely on anecdotes. I don't have to rely on a pundit to tell me this is the best way to run an event. I can actually base it off of evidence. That's why I love science. And I'm kind of hinting at it here. With science, you can win a Nobel freaking prize. I mean, wh why would you, I mean, if you could engineer an idea that would give you a Nobel prize, why would you not do it? So, um, Nobel prizes are interesting because they, in my opinion, represent the most creative, insightful glimpses into the natural world. Whole industries are based off of them, professional societies, schools of thought, and most importantly, conversations. And that's what we want here at Thirst. We want people to have intense conversations before, during, and after our events. We want them virtually. I hope you guys are tweeting right now. Um, I try to make these Twitter-ready phrases. That's too many words, probably. But the most important thing is that it's creative. I'm, I'm hinting at something here, because science really, at its core, is the rational investigation into the creative. Science is an inherently creative process. We just apply a different methodology to investigate it. So in many respects, science is very similar to art, literature, and music. Best way I can show this is with a picture. There's somebody doing molecular biology, clearly working on DNA, or not clearly if you're not a scientist. She's using a pipette, and that's uh, DNA in those little blue wells. If you just replace her pipette with a paintbrush, you're doing the same damn thing. It requires the same process. You're fundamentally creating something that didn't exist prior. In science's case, it's knowledge. In art, maybe it's a painting, music, uh, music piece. So the fundamental hypothesis, if there is one, and this is a terrible hypothesis, by the way. It's not formed properly. But does creativity have a logic to it? Could you engineer the probabilities to be as such that you could actually, the only result would be a Nobel Prize winning idea? And this is how we, we use this, uh, this thought to go forward when building creative communities. More importantly, why do I care? Why do you guys care? Um, because again, if you want to create a community, why not use science? It's actually more reliable than just what somebody Joe Schmo tells you on the street. And also, because I want to create more people like this guy. Today is Carl Sagan's birthday. Today is, yes, thank you. Give me a hand. That's exactly right. This guy, if you don't know who he is, you should go look him up because he was as fluid and, and, and poetic in literature as he was in evolution and in physics. He inspired wonder about the natural world and he did it entertainingly and there are no more like him. The closest maybe is Neil deGrasse Tyson um, and Seth MacFarlane, believe it or not, who's a huge geek. But I really want to create more people like this and we do this at Thirst as well. We want to attract really creative people. So how do we do that? Um, the science really has coalesced in a couple of things. Uh, scientific creativity and creativity in general, and what I call enlightened or, or enhanced creativity, is based on allowing a certain amount of unpredictability into a system around a base of knowledge. So I'm going to explain a little bit what I mean by that. So you have to introduce chance into this situation. And I'm going to do an experiment, experiment on you. All right, so randomness is really hard to understand. So if I'm talking about probabilities, it's, humans are just terrible at understanding probability. So on the left-hand side, raise your hand if you think that represents a random distribution of blue dots. All right, on the right-hand side, do you think the black represents a random distribution of blue? OK, if you have your hand up for, for black, keep it up. Turn to your right and high-five all the people that didn't put their hands up. Yeah, logic conundrum. Anyway, buy them a drink or something. Introduce yourself. So on the right is actually a random distribution. Random clusters, which is, which is really interesting. People don't realize this. And it's not your fault if you didn't do it right. In fact, you've evolved to be terrible at understanding random. You have an overly developed pattern sensing ability in your brain, and it was for your survival as a species. It was much better to think there was a tiger in the, bu the bushes every time you walk by than to be wrong that one time. So we see patterns even when they don't exist. So we have to introduce a sort of randomness or unpredictability into a creative process, but also adding a constraint to that unpredictability. Um, and this builds successful products and communities. Got to do one more science lesson here. Going to go back to 1662. This is Robert Boyle. Anyone remember eighth grade chemistry? No, I did not think you did. Awesome. This is Boyle, and he created Boyle's Law. If you compress a gas by half, you'll increase its pressure by twofold. It's a really simple rule. Mark here is laughing in the front because it's bringing back Mark's a scientist, too. Um, and so what's interesting is when you put pressure on it, you increase the probability that any one particle is going to interact with another one. It's going to bounce off a lot more. We do this at Thirst in two ways, with our attendees and our speakers. At the, at the event itself, like if we had a room like this, we put the stage back here, put the bar back there. We put seats in between with many constriction points, so we'd force people to interact with each other. 
We also have people that are attendees that look just like you and I that we call conversation facilitators. And their job is to make sure that you bounce off and meet a lot of new people throughout the course of the evening. We also have a lot of things to distract you on your way. Interactive art, dancing, music, art exhibits, what have you. We'll put it all in there. That way you meet people. We don't even make people pay attention to talks. If you don't want to listen to them, that's, your, that's the speaker's fault, not you. So with speakers themselves, every talk that we do at Thirst is curated heavily. by We have a writing staff and a visual design staff. It takes two to four months to write a talk with us. No one's allowed to just kind of walk in and give a talk. And we do this because it puts a constraint on their creative process. They may have lots of different new ideas. We make them write, work with our writing staff and our visual design staff. And we make them, we force them into a box effectively, but allow them to do whatever they can in that time limit, that box, what have you. So if you want to, so why, why do a couple companies have the lion's share of really successful creative products? Let's use Apple, for example. Well, actually, you can model uh, the create, creative process in terms of how successful you're going to be with what's called a Poisson distribution. This is what this curve is right here. Don't need to know much about it, except for you put where Einstein head, Einstein's head is, uh, increase, this is the increased probability you'll have an exceedingly successful idea. So companies like Apple do a lot of things where they, there's a couple of characteristics that they all do all the time that remake, keep their probability very high and under that area of the curve. So how do we do this? Well, the rule number one you always hear is know thy audience, right? Rule number one of, of presentation, this is bullshit, all right? I don't know why people tell you this. I don't know you guys. I don't, I don't know who you guys are. What you need to do is you need to lead your audience. That's what you're supposed to do if you want to create a creative community. Um, people are busy. I've heard many things. People are on their phones all the time. Um, the uh, Justin Bieber kid talking about high school, um, he was, we were talking about all the things that He's really, he was really good at it. He looks like Justin Bieber. Um, he's, listen, he's probably got more money than me. So um, anyway, that it's, re <laughs> it's really important that you're on your phone all the time, right? All right, I actually encourage this. People are busy and they like to be busy. We found out research tells you people actually really like having lots of stuff to do all the time. And exceedingly creative people are no different. So you have to tell them where they need to go, give them a platform, and start those conversations instead of having them wander through the event, wander through their experience of the product. So really what you should be doing is know thy message. Define your message first, and that defines your audience. And that's a better approach in our opinion. And it seems to work really well. We have created a nerd night culture in DC with hundreds of people from all walks of life. And we've, we've cornered this, act, this market of active millennials, millennial like people like my age, that do stuff with the knowledge they learn. And we, we cut across all fields of science as well. So how do we do this at Thirst? Well, a couple of things. We associate learning with things that are positive, as I mentioned earlier, that you already do. Um, when you go out, you like to have fun and enjoy yourself. Well, when you, again, you think of learning, you think of learning in a classroom. We'd like to not do that. We'd like you to think of learning as fun and interesting. So we associate learning with, with flirting and creativity. We also want to attract a specific type of person, a very creative person. So how do you do that? They have two characteristics that you want. One, they like a lot of new experiences and they like them all at once, believe it or not. This is where the research is telling us to do. And two, uh, they also, I forgot what my second reason was. Oh, yes, because I'm so distracted. What they like to do is they like to take mo the multiple formats of input that you have, right? So from the talks on stage, the DJ playing music, the interactive art, whatever, whatever you have, your phone. Exceedingly creative people can take that information in and then they can selectively shut off one of those inputs without actually it going away. Not everybody can do this, and this is the type of person we want, so our events are actually a filter for the type of people that we attract. So if I want to listen to the talk, the DJ is still playing music, I can actually actively shut that off in my mind, but it's actually still playing music. So that's something we look for in a creative community. The other thing, it seems really obvious, but that's why science is there, it actually shows this, try new things often. Um, if you go back to that Poisson curve where I had Einstein, his head, if you want to increase the chance, they found if you want to increase the chance of success, you have to try a lot of new things. They found that there's no correlation. Nobody has just a string of successes. There's no such thing as a toiling genius down in the basement. You have to do a lot of things and you have to interact, interact with a lot of people. And here are four characteristics that, that have been found, and again, I'm condensing a lot of science, hopefully down into uh, a short amount of time. Exceedingly creative people have a really cool uh, ability called a an heightened analogy formation ability. There are two types of analogies in this world, near and distant. A near analogy is like saying this table is like that table. A distant analogy is like saying this table is a lot like a 1972 Ford Fiesta and having actual some sort of connection built into it. 
Distant analogies help build creative products and communities. So the other thing is exposure to distant information, and this is kind of implied. You have your, your knowledge base where you know things. You have to go out and learn from disparate areas. We do this in science. Science is becoming increasingly this way as well. We actually learn very, very different fields and know them well enough that you actually can pull information in and make those distant analogies. The one in the bottom left is actually the least understood. But for some reason, exceedingly creative people and companies and communities all are exposed to serendipity. They have a lot of serendipitous moments. And we don't exactly know why, and we think it may be a, a, an effect of all three of these in combination, but I just wanted to mention it. And the last one, and it's most important to me, and I think the most interesting, is effective critical evaluation skills. This is very important in science. You have to be able to look at something and go, that's not right, or there's no evidence to back that up, or be able to sift through it and find the grain that's actually really important to you. So, um, some things that actually make or uh, limit creativity, having a lot of prior assumptions. And I'm not just saying wrong prior assumptions. Maybe you base all of your things off things that work already. That's actually shown by the research to actually not actually enhance your creative ability. Also, making a lot of near analogies is, apparently kills creativity. So again, think table, Ford Fiesta, moving on. Also, um, conceptual change, just like evolutionary change, happens gradually, step by step. And that's what's called tinkering um, in the creative world. And although it does improve things, it doesn't actually produce an optimal design. They've done a lot of experiments, especially with engineers, to find out that if they base their solutions off existing materials, they don't actually get a better design at the end overall. What you have to do is forget all existing prior assumptions and try to create from new. And I know it's really hard. You've heard it probably a million times. So you have to create that, create that crazy idea. So uh, what I'm going to do is probably try to give you one of these. And I have a lot more science I could talk to you. And I just want to hopefully whet your appetite. Feel free to talk to me afterwards. I really hate science jargon. I don't do it. Um, and I think that's one of the problems in the scientific field. But uh, if you want to create a creative community, I want you guys to think of a fairy tale. And that's right. You're having a scientist tell you to think of a fairy tale, uh, something made up and not real. So. A fairy tale, if you think about it, has all the characteristics of something you would want, a creative community or an idea. You tell a fantastical story that calls from information from dif different areas. It also requires, requires distant analogy formation. If you think of any fairy tale, it's fantastical stuff, and they try to make connections between disparate information. And also, it's telling a story. It's entertaining. It's interesting. And hopefully, in our case, it's colorful. Um, so uh, my challenge to you is to tell that fairy tale, to try to actually change creative thought, and if you want to create a creative community, this is one way to do it. I hope I've uh, whet your appetite. I'm here. I'm here to hang out, and uh, feel free to tweet at us. Thank you very much.